Well, this morning, as I've told you, we're going to be looking at Jesus' cleansing of the temple, and we'll find that in John chapter 2, in verses 13 through 25. Uh, John chapter 2, verses 13 through 25. Let me read these verses for you as we begin. The Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, and he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. And he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. His disciples remembered that it was written, zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews then said to him, What sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? Jesus answered them, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, It took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing his signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men, and because he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing again this morning. Now, remember we took a break last week, so we just want to do a little bit to catch up with where we are this morning. At this point, Jesus has gathered his disciples. His ministry is now underway. John has already shown us the first sign that Jesus did to prove that he was the Messiah, and that was turning the water into wine. And that miracle, that sign, had its desired result his disciples believed in him. John moves on now to record, at least in a certain sense, another sign to prove this point, that Jesus is the Son of God. But he also records this as an event that shows not only who Jesus is, but also something of the consuming desire that he had in his own life that his Father be glorified. And this event is what we call the first cleansing of the temple. Now, all the gospel writers record a cleansing of the temple at Jerusalem, but they differ as to the timing of this event. Uh, Matthew, Mark, and Luke actually place it at the end of Jesus' ministry, in that final week before his crucifixion, while John places it here at the beginning of his ministry, several years before his crucifixion. Now, we should ask the question, how can both of these things be true? Well, I think the simple answer is, again, understanding that Jesus' ministry lasted for three and a half years. He purged the temple once at the beginning and once at the end. These are two events rather than one. And seen in this light, I would like to just point out two things. First of all, the Jews apparently didn't learn their lesson the first time around because a couple of years later, Jesus finds them again inside the temple and he has to drive them out. But the second thing it shows us is this that Jesus' desire for his Father's glory had not lessened in those three years, even though he had to endure many things. He still had a zeal for his Father's glory. Now, it's this zeal that Jesus had for his Father's glory that I really want us to focus on this morning. Not only did Jesus provide us here with an example that we are to follow, that the same zeal should be in us, but if we belong to him, we should find this zeal within our hearts. This zeal not only for the Father's glory, but also this zeal for Jesus' glory. Now, let's consider three things from this passage. First of all, if you love the Lord, you will be zealous for his glory. That is, you'll not only desire it, but you'll desire it strongly. Secondly, that you need to be careful how you express your zeal. 
You need to do it in a way that honors him because this model Jesus gives us, we cannot follow to the letter. We have to do it according to the authority God gives to us and according to the particular situation. But finally, you need to examine your heart to make sure that the zeal that you think you have really comes from the Lord. And the way you can know that, of course, is the character of this zeal. Now, first of all, let's consider that if you love the Lord, you will be zealous for his glory. How do we know that? Well, Jesus loved his Father, and when he saw his Father dishonored, he moved, he acted to repair his Father's honor. He was zealous for his glory. Now, we read in verse 13, the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now, the Passover, as you recall, was one of the three annual feasts that brought every Jewish man to Jerusalem. Uh, the Lord said through Moses in Exodus 23, verses 14 through 17, Three times a year you shall celebrate a feast to me. You shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread. For seven days you are to eat unleavened bread as I commanded you at the appointed time in the month Abib, for in it you came out of Egypt. And none shall appear before me empty-handed. Also you shall observe the feast of the harvest of the firstfruits of your labors from what you sow in the field. Also the feast of the ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in the fruit of your labors from the field. Three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord God. Now, it may not seem clear from this particular reading which three feasts he's referring to, but let me just point out, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is the same feast as the Feast of Passover. The Feast of the Harvest of the First Fruits is the same as the Feast of Weeks or the Feast of Pentecost. And the Feast of the Ingathering is the same as the Feast of Tabernacles or the, the Feast of Booths. Now, again, these, each of these feasts had their particular purposes. Uh, Passover was commemorating the, the deliverance out of Egypt. Uh, the Feast of Weeks was counted so many weeks or Pentecost after Passover, and then they would celebrate that. But it was also the end gathering of the first fruits of their harvest. And then the Feast of Tabernacle of Booths, or the end gathering, was at the end of the harvest. And it was to remind them that they once wandered in tents, but God gave them a permanent place to live. He brought them into the land. He fulfilled his promises. So the Lord wanted them to remember these great events of his redemption and his mercy and grace to them so that they might worship him and love him in return, but also so that they might look forward to what those feasts were pointing to. And that is what Jesus Christ would do. Now again, these three feasts were mandatory for the men. Jewish women could also attend, of course, but for them it was optional. But because it was mandatory for the men, we see Jesus attending. He was faithful to his Father's will. Uh, not only because it was his duty, but because it was his delight. It was his joy to do the Father's will. And why was it his delight? Because Jesus loved his Father. Now, you know, it was particularly his delight knowing that at the Passover there would be this sacrificing of the Lamb which looked forward to his death on the cross. And not that Jesus necessarily looked forward to going through all that suffering and torture, but he did look forward to repairing his father's honor because remember that sacrifice was to satisfy his father's justice. And also in it, he looked forward to that which would save his people from their sins. So as Jesus is at the Passover and he sees the, the sacrifice of the lamb, it reminds him why he comes into the world, what he's going to do, and what he's going to accomplish through that. Well, we read that when Jesus went to the temple to worship, in verse 14, he found in the temple those who were selling oxen and sheep and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Basically, these animals were there for sacrifice, and the money changers were there to make sure the people who came were going to be able to give in the right denomination of currency and in the right kind of currency. Now, when John notes this, he wasn't telling us that these people had set up shop in the Holy of Holies. That would be blasphemous. Or even in the holy place. Or in the court of the priests where the sacrifices were being offered. Uh, these, these tables for merchandising were not really set up in what's called the court of the, of the Israelites, where the Jewish men would worship. 
or even in the court of women where the women would worship in the temple. And yes, there was segregation going on in the temple. But these places were set up in the court of the Gentiles, which is the, the outer court. Basically, if you can somehow envision the temple buildings and then the wall that surrounded the temple buildings, there was a space between the outer wall and the temple buildings, and that whole area was called the court of the Gentiles. That's where all of these things were set up. So not in the temple proper, at least it was inside the wall, but not in the buildings. All these people had actually gathered together there with the approval of the Jewish leaders to sell their sacrificial animals, the ones that were approved by the priests, the animals without blemish, and to exchange foreign currency for the currency of the temple and to break the larger bills into smaller bills, all in order to make money. They didn't care about God's worship. They just wanted to profiteer. So what did Jesus do? Well, Jesus, of course, um, became righteously angry over the situation. And we read in uh, verses 15 through 16, he made a scourge of cords and drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and the oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And to those who were selling the doves, he said, take these things away. Stop making my father's house a place of business. By the way, a lot is made over the fact that he told those who were selling doves to take them out of the house instead of just sort of breaking the cages open and letting them fly like he seemed to drive all the other animals out. But I think it's because it's kind of hard to catch a dove once it gets out. So he didn't, you know, despoil everybody of their goods. He drove them out of the temple, but he wasn't trying to steal anything or rob anybody of what was rightfully theirs. He just didn't want them to have these things in the temple doing what they were doing, which is making money for themselves. Now again, why did Jesus do this? Well, he did it, of course, because of, um, it was the right thing to do. But he also did it to fulfill prophecy because this is exactly what the Old Testament prophets said was going to happen. The Lord said through Malachi the prophet in Malachi 3, verses 1 through 4. And just see how this lines up with Old Testament prophecy and know that this is our Lord fulfilling this. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. We know that was John the Baptist. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, and the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. But who can endure the day of his coming? And who can stand when he appears? For he is like a refiner's fire and like fuller's soap. He will sit as a smelter and purifier of silver. And he will purify the sons of Levi and refine them like gold and silver so that they may present to the Lord offerings in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. Uh, it is interesting that he would come suddenly. He would come as it were on the, on the as it were trailing behind this messenger of the covenant uh, who was coming and he would come suddenly to his temple in order to purify it, you see. So it shouldn't surprise us that there was a, as it were, a first cleansing of the temple at the beginning of his ministry. And when they didn't learn his lesson, one at the end as well. But again, the thing we want to focus on is this. He also did it because he loved the Father. And he wanted above everything else to see the Father honored, to see him glorified which is why his disciples saw, when they saw what he did, they remembered that it was written in uh, verse 17, quoting Psalm 69, zeal for your house will consume me. Now I already said earlier, Jesus did this, of course, to fulfill prophecy. He did it because of his love for the Father, but he also did it as an example. He did it as an example for you that you should also stand up for him and for his father's honor. This is your duty. But this should also be your heart, right? Remember, the commandments that the Lord lays upon us are not a burden to those who love those things because it's what we already want to do. If you tell somebody to do something they already want to do, well, yes, pride might well up inside of them and they may not like it because, you know, you're, you're telling them they have to do it. But if they already love 
that thing you're telling them to do, it's not going to be hard to do it because you already want to do it. And that should be the case with you as well and with me. If we love the Lord, we are going to find within ourselves a zeal for His honor. Now, how do we know that? Well, we should already know it by now just by living in this world, but just think about it in your own personal relationships. How do you feel when somebody insults somebody that you love, somebody that you care about? What does it make you feel like doing? Doesn't it make you feel like rising up and standing up to defend them, to defend their name, uh, to come to their you know, defense, so to speak? Well, it, it does me. I'm sure it does you as well. But what about when somebody offends the one whom you love more than anything else and more than anyone else? What about when somebody insults the one you love with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul? and all your strength. How should that make you feel? Well, again, it should make you stand up to defend the honor of the one you love. Now, if you are a believer, the Bible says that this is the kind of love that you have for him. This is the kind of, that the Spirit creates in those who belong to him. Uh, the kind that gives you a regard for God you know, enough of a love and respect for him that you'll stand for his defense and a regard that his ways not be violated. In essence, this is really what the new covenant is all about, isn't it? Because the, the law written on stone didn't have the power to change hearts. They could only read it, know they've broken it, and know they're condemned by it. That was the purpose of the Mosaic Covenant, to teach them that they needed Jesus Christ. But what's the purpose of the new covenant? Well, the purpose of the new covenant is to take that law and write it on your hearts to give you the ability to keep it. The author to the Hebrews, quoting what the Lord says to the prophet Jeremiah in Hebrews 8.10, says this, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God and they shall be my people. What he means is he's going to give his spirit to change our character and our nature, to make us love what we hated before, which would in essence set us free from sin, would fulfill what Paul says to Titus when he came into this world to redeem a people from lawless deeds and to purify them and make them zealous for good deeds. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans chapter 8, verses 2 through 4. For the law of the spirit of life, and by the way, he means here by law, not a written law, but the principle of the spirit as he enters into your soul and does this saving work, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and of death. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, your flesh, God did sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh so that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What Paul means is, if you're a partaker of this work of the Holy Spirit, you're no longer staring at stone tablets, wondering how am I going to be able to keep this in my own strength, in my own flesh. I can't. It can only condemn me but rather the Spirit of God is working inside of you, giving you a love for that law so that you will obey it from the heart. He gives you the power to do what you could not do before. Now, how do you know whether He has done that for you? Well, what you're going to see are the same things going on in your heart that was going on in Jesus uh, when you see people doing things that are dishonoring to the Lord, you're going to be offended the way that Jesus was offended. When you find people talking about things they shouldn't be talking about that are dishonoring to the Lord, you're going to be offended by that as well, and you're going to find yourself not only wanting to do something about it, but actually doing something about it. You will have a zeal for His honor, and the greater your love for the Lord is, the greater that zeal is going to be. Now that brings us to the second point because this picture that Jesus gives us, this example is not something that we can just apply uh, 
um, you know, straight across. You know, we, we do need to understand that Jesus had authority that we don't have. Uh, and and uh, this particular opportunity that uh, we are never going to find ourselves having because the temple no longer exists. You do need to be careful how you express your zeal to make sure that you do it in a way that honors him. If we just, you know, took this directly across, as I said before, if we see somebody doing something dishonoring to the Lord, are we supposed to just grab a whip or a club and start beating the person? Well, no, of course not. That's not what the Lord wants us to do. And yet what Jesus did was the right thing for him to do. Now, when Jesus saw what they were doing to his father's worship, he drove them all out with a whip. That was his expression, you see, of his zeal for the Lord. But is that what you and I are supposed to do? Well, it depends, doesn't it? <laughs> depends on your position. Depends on your responsibility. Depends on your authority. And, of course, the particular situation. Depends on a number of things. Now, let's first of all ask ourselves the question, what gave Jesus the right to do what he was doing? Well, that's exactly what the leaders of the temple wanted to know, as well as those who were doing business in the temple when they found their lucrative business suddenly brought to an end by Jesus' whip. In verse 18, we read this, the Jews then said to him, what sign do you show us as your authority for doing these things? In other words, putting it in, in modern terms, Jesus, you're going to have to answer for what you've just done here unless you can demonstrate that you have a right to do what you've just done. Now, did Jesus have that right? Well, of course we know that he did because Jesus is God in human flesh. The, the temple he just drove them out of belonged to him. That was his temple. And that was his father's worship that was being violated. He had every right to do what he did. But now how is he going to demonstrate that to them? Uh, well, he chose to show them a sign. They said, give us a sign, Jesus, to show us that you have this authority. So he did choose a sign. And the sign that he chose was the only sign that he ever gave to hardened unbelievers. Not the one they were expecting, but the one that would prove that he was who he said he was. He gave them the sign of the resurrection. We just looked at that last week, remember, and we saw something about what it means. Jesus, uh, in verses 19 through 22, says this. Jesus answered them. Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, it took 46 years to build this temple, and will you raise it up in three days? But he was speaking of the temple of his body. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this. And they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. Now notice it was still a sign. It was a sign to unbelievers. And it was also a sign to believers. And his people who believed in him believed. Now I do want to draw your attention to what we've seen before about signs and miracles. Remember that signs and miracles are basically works of divine power that are meant to instill awe or fear so that they stop traffic so that people will listen to what that one doing the miracle is saying. It's basically God giving them divine credentials. And that's what they wanted to see. Where are your divine credentials? Jesus, do a miracle so we can know you're from God. Well, we do need to remember as well that Jesus only did these miracles in the presence either of those who believed or those who might believe, but he didn't do them for those who adamantly did not believe. In their case, he always pointed to the resurrection. And why did he point to the resurrection? Because the resurrection was his vindication from the Father. Verse 19 again, he says, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. That was the sign he was pointing to. He was talking about the resurrection. He did exactly the same thing in Matthew 12 verses 38 through 40. Uh, where we read, then some of the scribes and Pharisees said to him, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation craves for a sign, and yet no sign will be given to it but the sign of Jonah the prophet. For just as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights 
in the heart of the earth. Again, Jesus points these hardened opponents to the only sign he was willing to give them, the sign of the resurrection, because the, sign, the, the resurrection proves, remember, we saw last week, that his payment on the cross was received by his Father, payment in full for all of our sins. But at the same time, it proved that everything that Jesus said about himself and everything that he said, period, was true. That was his vindication. So did Jesus have the right to do what he did in the temple? Well, yes, he did. And his resurrection would prove it. Not right away to their satisfaction, but would prove it later and only to those who had faith. Verse 22, we, we see that, as a matter of fact, it did prove to those who had faith that he is the Messiah. So when he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he said this, and they believed the scripture and the word which Jesus had spoken. What about these Jews that were asking him for the sign at that particular juncture? Did they believe him? Did they have faith? Apparently not. They thought he was talking about the literal temple and they couldn't see how Jesus could rebuild in a mere three days what had taken 46 years to build uh, originally. And yet we see they left him alone and I think it was because of the signs that he was doing. Because remember, the ones that John record are not the only signs that Jesus did. At the end of the book, he said, Jesus did many other things, which, if they were all written down, the world itself would not be able to contain the books that would be written. And we're going to see in just, well, actually in just a moment, that Jesus did many other signs and people believed. And I think they left him alone at this point because they were convinced by these signs that he was the Messiah. Now again, Jesus did what he did because he had the authority to do this. The question is, do we have the authority to do this? What does this say to you about how you should express your zeal for God's glory? Well, first of all, we, you need to recognize that Jesus did something you can't do. Okay? He had authority to cleanse the temple because he is the Son of God. You don't have that authority. I don't have that authority. You can't do things exactly in the same way that Jesus did. When you act, you have to act according to the authority that he has given to you. But you do need to act. Okay. Now, I, I found an interesting historic example of this very thing in um, the time of the, the Puritans, actually. Some of you may be familiar with the Solemn League and National Covenant that was signed by reform believers throughout the three kingdoms of Great Britain. I hope I used the right term for that. England, Scotland, and Ireland. I'm sure there was something there that got missed. But uh, these three kingdoms signed this pact. The reformed believers, okay, in order to reform religion and to continue to reform that religion, they bound themselves together to honor God by upholding His word according to the place that God had put them in, the authority that he had given them. And they believed that this was their responsibility before God, which it was, and this is what they wanted to do because they loved the Lord. In other words, they used whatever advantage God gave them to promote his kingdom, to promote his will. Now the point is, from Jesus' example and, and from these who are following his example, if you are his servant, you are going to do the same thing. But you're going to do it where you are, in the place he has put you. If you love him, you're going to do it because you really can't do otherwise. Love dictates that you rise up in defense of that which you love. And so as the Lord gives to you authority and as he gives to you opportunity you need to exercise it in that way if he happens to give you governmental office use it for his glory the authority that you have in the home in the church or even as he gives you we wouldn't necessarily call it authority but it's still an application of this principle as he gives you opportunities among neighbors among peers people in the workplace family members friends acquaintances or even brothers and sisters in the church. You see, we, we exercise this zeal in a way that is consistent with the relationship through which we exercise it. 
I mean, a, a parent may deal with a child in a particular way, but a brother and sister in the Lord would deal with it in another way. A husband and a wife, a magistrate to a citizen, or a citizen to a citizen. It depends on the relationship. It depends on what kind of authority we're clothed with that will dictate how we approach that person. But we need to make sure we don't step outside of our bounds. You know, if we see government officials doing things we shouldn't, they shouldn't be doing, we're, we're again not going to grab some kind of a weapon and go after them because if that happened, we obviously get into a lot of trouble. That's not what the Lord wants us to do. So put your whips away, okay, for now, and uh, think about how the Lord would have you to do this. Now, Okay, so we should be zealous, but we need to be careful how we exercise that zeal. Finally, you need to examine your heart to make sure the zeal that you have is really zeal for Him and not for something else. And I think we can draw that principle. I mean, it's not directly out of what we see in these last couple of verses, but it is an implication of it. John closes this section with an interesting comment in verses 23 through 25. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover during the feast, many believed in his name, observing the signs which he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, was not entrusting himself to them, for he knew all men. And because he did, he did not need anyone to testify concerning man, for he himself knew what was in man." I already told you, and I think it's clear in Scripture, Jesus did not perform the signs that he did for those whose hearts he knew were already bent against him. But he did perform them for those who believed, for those who were his disciples, and for those who might believe, um, as we see here. But I want you to notice something interesting. Jesus' attitude toward those who believed. I mean, there were people who saw the signs, people who believed in him. Jesus was not willing to entrust himself to them. Not in the same way that he had toward his disciples. And the question we need to ask is, why not? Well, it's because, John tells us, he knew what was in their hearts. He knew what was really going on there. Uh, there were many who had seen his miracles. They were convinced he was from God. Uh, they were convinced that he was the Messiah. They followed him for a time. But we recognize as we look at the end of the story, they really did not know Jesus Christ. They really weren't saved. They really didn't have the saving work of the Spirit of God in their hearts. They really didn't love him. And how do we know that? Well, it's because the vast majority of these people who followed him called out for his blood at the end. So what kind of faith did these people really have? Well, they had the kind of faith that we call historic faith. They believed that Jesus was the Messiah but they really didn't love him. They didn't really receive him. And the reason they didn't is because they didn't have this work of the Spirit of God in their hearts. You know, miracles in those days can have, can have that effect. And, you know, we, we, can ha well, we can experience the same thing today or people can experience that they can be convinced that Christianity is true in their heads, but not really change in their hearts. And that kind of a person is this kind of a person. A person who believes, but a person to whom Jesus is not willing to entrust himself because the hearts are still dark, the hearts are still in sin, the hearts still do not love him. Now, among other things, this calls each of us to examine our hearts to make sure that we have received the grace of God and that our faith is not just intellectual, but it's also a faith of the heart. Do we really have God's grace in our hearts? The only way we can know, of course, is whether or not we really love him. And in keeping with our theme this morning, we should ask this question. Is the zeal, first of all, do we have any zeal for God? Do we find within ourselves a desire to rise up to his defense when we see his name dishonored? Is that zeal there at all? But secondly, if you do find a zeal in your heart, is this zeal born out of a genuine love for God and a genuine desire to do your neighbor good? Or is there some other motive that's behind it? We do need to remember that these people here, as well as many Jews, claimed to be zealous for God. But their zeal was not really for Him because they really didn't love Him. It, it really came from some other motive. 
uh, for many of the Jews, it was self-righteousness. In Romans chapter 10, verses 1 through 4, Paul notes the zeal of the Jews. He says, brethren, my heart's desire and my prayer to God for them is for their salvation. For I testify about them that they have a zeal for God, but not in accordance with knowledge. For not knowing about God's righteousness and seeking to establish their own, they did not subject themselves to the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone who believes. Now this is also a matter of the heart, but Paul could point to the fact that clearly even on the outside we could see their zeal was born out of something other than serving Christ because their zeal, in their zeal, they hated him and they wanted to kill him and his followers. So they have a zeal, but it's not a zeal according to knowledge. It's not a zeal according to righteousness. And, you know, the simple point is you can have a zeal, but it doesn't necessarily mean that you're a Christian. That doesn't necessarily mean that the zeal is born out of a love for God. Now, over the years, I've met several professing Christians who believed that they loved God and were doing all that they did for, for God's glory. But oftentimes, they were acting more like Jews than they were acting like Christ, who were doing things basically out of a spirit of legalism rather than out of a spirit of love. You know, the Jews were, wanted to make sure that everybody was submissive to them and were doing things the way they wanted them to be done rather than, of course, doing them according to God's standards. And I've seen that in people as well who simply want to promote their own agenda rather than that of Christ. And, and, you know, oftentimes we can tell when that takes place by the results of, of what they do and, and what the outcome of it is. And with the people that I have in, in mind, the offense, or I should say the results were always offense and division. The Spirit of Christ works toward unity. He doesn't work toward division, but I've seen some. I mean, this church, as you know, in the history of this church, uh, was split right down the middle, our congregation. And uh, there was a, a group of people that were angry and were calling out for, well, I, I, I use this term, um, again, just as an image, blood. But um, there was another group that was aiming towards reconciliation. And I asked myself, okay, which one is really zealous for God? I'd say the one that was working towards love and reconciliation, the ones that were angry and just wanted to split the congregation down the middle. They had a zeal, and they believed their zeal was for God, but it really didn't come from a desire to glorify Him because if it did, they would have wanted reconciliation, they would have wanted unification, they would have wanted to promote peace and unity, but they didn't do that. Now, we do have to admit that even the truth can divide even when it's presented in the most gracious and gentle and careful and loving way possible. I mean, look at what Jesus did. He did everything perfectly, and yet what he did was still created some division. I'm not saying you can avoid all division in a case like this. But it's also the case that in our zeal for the truth, we can forget to exercise the kind of love and patience that we should have towards one another. Now, we should ask the question, what about Jesus again? Did he violate this principle when he, when he made that whip and he drove these merchants out of the temple? Well, no, as a matter of fact, he didn't. There are times when those to whom we minister really know better and they, they need this kind of rebuke. And really, who could know better than the Jews that have been raised in this tradition? They knew better than that. They knew they shouldn't be doing that. They knew what they were doing was wrong, clearly. That's why Jesus in 70 AD, brings judgment on them because they should have recognized the Messiah when he came. They should have received him. They had no excuse. But they turned him over and had him crucified and then persecuted his followers for the next 40 years. So there are times when it's time to lower the hammer, but there are other times when grace and mercy and patience are the order of the day. Here's another example. Jesus and his disciples were traveling towards Jerusalem for the last time, and because his face was set towards Jerusalem when they came to a Samaritan village and he sent his disciples forward to make arrangements for them, the Samaritans would not receive him. And so how did the disciples respond to this in, in Luke 9, verses 54 through 56? We read, when his disciples James and John saw this, they said, Lord, do you want us to command fire to come down from heaven and consume them? But he turned and rebuked them and said, you do not know what kind of spirit you are of. For the Son of Man did not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. 
and they went on to another village. Well, there are circumstances, you see, where Jesus grabs a whip and he drives them out of the temple. And on another occasion, when they refused to receive him because of their ignorance, because they didn't have the lights and the opportunity that the Jews had, no, I, that's not why I've come, not to destroy men. And even when he drove those people out of the temple, he didn't do that in, in, you know, with hatred in his heart, but with holy zeal and love for his father and I think even a desire to do those men good. Because sometimes, you know, you do need stripe on your back, you know, to point you in the right direction. And think about this as well. I mean, Jesus was perfect in every way. He saw every imperfection that were in his disciples all the time. He could have taken one step and said, Peter, you need to repent of that particular sin. Another step, James, what you did there was wrong. You shouldn't have done that. John, what you said, you know, I mean, he could have, he could have gone on endlessly and criticized his disciples to the ground because he knew what perfection is and he knew every time they stepped out of perfection. But I do want you to recognize that Jesus exercised a great deal of patience with his disciples. And why did he do that? Because he loved his disciples and he wanted them to succeed. He also, of course, knew their hearts and knew they were genuine, genuine believers. He didn't want to overtax them. He didn't want to overburden them, but he wanted to do what needed to be done to encourage them to go in the right way. Now, all of this is simply to say this, bringing it back to our theme, is that when we feel compelled in our spirits to stand up for something that we believe is dishonoring to the Lord, we need to make sure that we do it for the right reasons. That is, for God's honor and glory, not you know, to promote our agendas, but His, but also with the right hearts, with the right spirits. You know, we need to make sure... Um, that we taper it according to the person that we're dealing with. If they're a believer or an unbeliever, if they're a believer, whether they're mature or whether they're ignorant or immature, you know, and the Lord especially cautions us that when we deal with one another, we need to make sure that we deal very gently. We need to make sure that we weigh, as it were, the seriousness of the, fe of the offense against the maturity of that brother or sister and not rebuke them as it were too strongly or come in a spirit that might drive them away from Christ rather than driving them to Christ. And again, I would just remind you of Jesus' example toward his disciples. And I have another personal example. You live long enough, you get you know some of these things as it were uh, tucked in the background, but my own sister, who was married to a Christian man, going to a church, had raised in that church, was members of that church for a long time. Well, something happened to their marriage. And the church turned on my sister, and they were harsh and severe, and they drove her out of the church. And you know what? I mean, from our perspective, she was the innocent party. Her husband had committed adultery against her. She divorced him, rightly so, because he was unrepentant. But the church for the, whatever reason, turned on her because she was the one who initiated the divorce and they drove her out of the church. And they not only drove her out of the church, but they drove her away from Christ. She wanted nothing to do with him. Now we would say, yeah, likely she wasn't a Christian at that time. But I'll tell you what, their attitude, their demeanor had a lot to do with it. And the Lord worked in her heart over the years, over the years, she came to know the Lord and she came to realize that what those people had done was not representing Christ. That was not Jesus that did that to her, you see. That was those people with their own agenda and their own zeal. They may have thought what they were doing was right, but they went about it an entirely wrong way and they drove her away from Christ. We want to make sure that we don't do that in our zeal for God's glory. In closing, let me just read this closing passage by Paul and, 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 and pray and suggest that God give us this grace to be able to apply this that we need to, in the way we need to apply it so that we don't become guilty of doing the same thing that this other church did in driving somebody away from the Lord. Paul writes in Galatians 6 verses 1 and 2, Brethren, if anyone is caught in any trespass, you who are spiritual, restore such a one in a spirit of gentleness, each one looking to yourself so that you too will not be tempted. 
bear one another's burdens and thereby fulfill the law of Christ. Remember when you're dealing with one another to try to preserve that spirit of unity and the bond of peace. We need to make sure, as it's been mentioned on another occasion, that, that you know what, that unity is, is fragile, and, I, and granted it is. But the thing that breaks it is when we're harsh and severe and we don't do things for the right reasons or we don't do it in the right way, we need to make sure we do it as Paul tells us here. In the spirit of gentleness, if we are spiritual, if we have the Spirit of God in our hearts and the love of God, to try to draw that person to Christ and not just lower the hammer on them because they're doing something that is wrong. We need to try to bring them in and not drive them away. Well, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to take all this that we've seen, and we've seen quite a bit, and help us to apply it and to actually put on or to do what the Lord calls us to do.